Okay, so thank you very much um, um, for, the, for this um, great um, conference. Um, so I would like to give, show you something out of um, the CRCNS project OxyState that I did together with um, Christiane Linster from Cornell on um, how um, representations um, during the retrieval of social familiarity look like. Um, so Christiana already mentioned, um, and the main part of this experimental work, also it's only a part of the project um, that I will show today is from David. Um, we're dealing with a, a very simple behavior that has been extensively used in behavioral neuroscience over many decades, and that is um, you meet one mouse meets or another one um, meets um, another one, um, and then it should remember it so when it encounters it. And, and there is a behavioral tendency, if you know an animal, you will explore it less. So, and what we also know is that um, this behavioral um, social recognition um, requires oxytocin during exploration, but not during the later recognition. Um, so one thing that we first wondered is, um, where is this oxytocin released? And what we observed is, as you can he see here with the vague fMRI, um, when we optogenetically evoked oxytocin release in the hypothalamus, um, specifically in the, in the PBN, um, we saw um, a number of regions outside of the hypothalamus where we actually stimulated. Um, and one of the, the regions with the highest bold activation um, was the, the anterior olfactory nucleus. So we confirmed this. Um, by awake recordings in the same animals um, with the optogenetic stimulation again, and we indeed saw that um, there was an increase, a positive slide modulation in the activity that was significant. Okay, so then another thing what we had um, also observed was that when we selectively knocked out oxytocin in this anterior olfactory cortex, um, the, these animals did not, could not remember um, the other one at a behavioral level, one has to say. Um, so they had no preference in the approach behavior. Um, what we had done already in this past paper was um, that we could clarify how one, one pathway, how oxytocin modulates the olfactory processing um, via top-down glutamatergic projections onto interneurons, and then it modulated the um, order responses with an increase of signal to noise. However, what it hasn't clarified um, is what's happening actually here at the neuronal coding level. And I think there is one, one important aspect. So when usually, I mean, that the, there is um, the recognition conceived as one thing, um, and that makes a big difference. So whether you think that an animal makes, so recognizes something, then makes a decision to approach or not, and because that happens repeatedly, um, we, we maybe should separate those two processes. And that's what we are trying to do. Um, so to look more at a, at a recognition of the sensory input and at the cortical representation and the intention and salience. Um, so since this was going away from the standard approach of looking at the behavioral output, um, we had to um, build a more direct uh, measure of social cognition. And then with the second goal um, to um, examine um, the type of memory. So we, based on this habituation with the lesser exploration, we had built um, a model, a biophysical model, um, together with Christiane that we published where we showed that it could be actually, because it's an intermediate length duration memory, that um, you have a habituation process, maybe no other responses and due to these repeated exposures, and then it comes back over time, so, and that's the, the memory. An alternative would be that it, it's more consistent with the long-term or general memory, that it's reinforced and makes the representation actually in the cortices more distinct. Um, to do so, um, we, um, we built an approach um, to, to once look at stimulus identity and then also this feature like strain or familiarity that could be also generally used. And the way we did it is that we put little um, box, um, built little boxes where we, um, that were sealed where the animals were sitting in after, for instance, an exposure. Um, and then we, um, and then we um, 
put the air, uh, channeled air over the animal continuously, and then through the olfactory meter, we could transiently, in a very precise fashion, and present the order so that we can really do it like a standard order in the olfactory meter. That's the way how these boxes look like, and um, so you can watch the animals, and they actually surprisingly um, don't care much about sitting in these um, sealed boxes. And then at the bottom here, you see also that when you apply it 20, 30 times, um, you get very stable responses repeatedly. Okay, so when we um, then record it, this shows you from the anterior olfactory cortex in, in the awake mouse, a single session there, um, three unfamiliar animals, um, two of the same strain, one of another strain, and then also two non-social orders. And then you see this typical pattern, I mean, I think it's, it's around 70 neurons that we recorded simultaneously with tetrodes, and you see um, this distributed coding pattern um, that um, Kevin Franks um, has, has shown before and others also um, in the, here in the piriform cortex. So this seems to behave very similarly. But how, so to get from here um, to this feature encoding, what we did is um, we average the, um, all the data from the, the emitter and the receiver mice um, and build a population vector that we split according to um, the, the, the type of stimulus. So for instance, um, black 6 and CD1. And what you see then, so this is from the same data then averaged, is that um, the Euclidean distance from baseline is very similar for the, for, the social feature, um, for the social animals here. And also when you look at the population trajectory um, after time embedding, they also look quite similar. Um, so this gives you an overview. So recordings um, from three brain regions. So we have the anterior olfactory nucleus, the posterior piriform, the lateral enterorhinal, and then we additionally also imaged always the, the pupil and the sniff. And what you see here is that for some of the features, so this is always a statistical test for the pairwise comparisons, um, for some of the features, for instance, social versus non-social, or here for the posterior piriform, you can distinguish two different mouse strains. But for the same mouse strain, which is the upper left, here the green boxed one, um, they were never significantly different, which might be, which is, um, also um, has to be considered that these animals had never been seen before by the receiver mouse. Okay, so this indicated that, I mean, using this, this um, population approach, we could um, examine such features um, of familiarity. And so what we did is um, we performed a freely moving social interaction, then put the interaction partner into one of the boxes, another one, a novel one that the animal, the receiver has never seen, and then um, presented the orders repeatedly and analyzed the data. And one, the first thing that one notices is um, regarding saliency, um, we see a, high, a stronger sniff response and also a pupil response towards the familiar. So this might already indicate that it's actually, the actual cognition process is not a habituation. Okay. And then looking at the neuronal data, what we see is that, and it's maybe here easier to say from the graph, um, that the, the, the deflection from baseline for the familiar was stronger than for the novel. And this also applied in the posterior piriform cortex, but interestingly not in the lateral enterorhinal, which might not be surprising because um, the lateral enterorhinal, one of the things that people think it does is, is more like envi environmental association, which should in this task um, not play a role. Um, and then also what I don't show here, so in the, in the VTA and also in the olfactory bulb, which one actually can see here, um, we see also a stronger differentiation and we also see that this information is channeled top down from the anterior olfactory nucleus, um, the familiarity information to the olfactory bulb. Here for instance with fiber formatometry or also when we look at the LFP. Um, now, the second question of what, what would be a requirement for this memory would be um, that it should be oxytocin dependent because the behavior is oxytocin dependent. Um, so, oops, sorry, that was too fast. Um, so, what we did is we transiently activated oxyto a boosted oxytocin release um, beyond the, the naturally occurring one during this freely social interaction and then repeated basically our test. And what you see is compared um, to the natural condition, 
we see a strong uh, differentiation in the population trajectory. And also, when comparing this control condition with this boosted oxytocin condition, we see that um, the, the two orders are farther pushed apart in their representation. And finally, um, when we knock out the oxytocin receptors in the AN, we would expect that this memory can't form. Also, the cortical representation should not be formed, and this shows you here um, the oxytocin receptor mutant um, when we perform the same experiment. Um, and we also see that it rather decreases. So we see a mild habituation in that case, actually. Okay, so to summarize, um, animals are recognized by their volatile body odors alone, and the early olfactory system is involved in both memory formation and retrieval. And oxytocin modulation um, in the anterior olfactory cortex increases top-down the SNR um, in olfactory processing and is required to enable later social recognition at the level of encoding, cognition, and behavior. And the retrieved representation of familiar animals in primary olfactory cortices are reinforced and more distinct from other animals with more salience assigned to the familiar. Um, and I think the, this approach with these little boxes um, to, to more directly study the cognition um, can, be, can be used quite broadly. So for instance, one thing that we are doing currently a lot is, so we built this um, non-invasive sensor-rich maze where we can monitor um, reversal learning, um, social hierarchy, social interaction behavior, and then take the animals that live there for roughly six months intermittently and put, and where we can track each individual, and then put them in, in, the, in the scanner um, where we perform in the awake um, experiments that involve social cognition where they are presented, for instance, by animals they know which, which they had experienced before. Okay, and with that, I would like to close. Thank you. Thanks for the good talk. A couple of very naive questions. Where are the oxytocin receptors expressed, and what happens when the receptors are activated? Um, what cell types do you know? So in the AON, um, it's, the, it's the projection. So we did, what we did is, is in, in the past, we did a cuff pre um, retrograde labeling, and then we see that it's in the, the, the receptor is in the, in the um, probably in the projection. So it, it must be project, glutamatergic projection neurons, so it's glutamatergic neurons. In the amygdala, it's interestingly different. There, there it's more in it. Right. And your second question? What, what is the effect of activation of the receptors? Um, we see an, a, a shift in the real base so that they are more prone to spike. I mean, that's what we, so we did rec um, recording, patch clamp recordings before from them. Um, thank you for the talk. Have you looked at the are possible applications, I believe, both for schizophrenia and autism spectrum disorders because of the extrapyramidal cells and the oxytocin uh, and social approach. Have you looked into the uh, applicability and for those two disorders? Yes, yeah, so we, we looked, we, we did, um, two years ago, we, we had a study where we looked at a bidirectional, um, so uh, it, was, it was a humanized mutant um, for, for shank overexpression that was interesting because it has a bidirectional effect on whether it increases or decreases the, the sociability, whether over you overexpress the mutant or the, the truncated version or the wild type. And there we recorded from the AON, and there we saw matching increases that um, the signal to noise dropped um, for the lesser sociability, but it increased for the, for the, for the overly normal um, or more than normal um, sociability. Okay, let's thank Wolfen. Thank you.